would like to introduce Walter Wynn, who will get us started this morning with introductions. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Walter Wynn. I live here in Oak Hammock, and I am the so-called facilitator of this series. But actually, I ran into Andrea a couple of years ago, and she was one of our speakers. And I asked her if she would be my recruiter. So she has willingly done that. And a brief personal note to Lila, I will send you the PDF later this morning. So uh, welcome. And I'll turn it over for the introduction of the introduction to Andrea. Thank you. And good luck in Maine. I used to live in York Harbor for a couple of years. Um, thank you for the introduction, Walter. Um, good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker this morning, Augusta Farnham. Um, so Augusta lives in Brooklyn, Maine, um, and she received her bachelor's in photography at Bard College in 1998 and is now a master's student in the UF Department of Art in Medicine. Her capstone project will study the intersection of art and medicine. A wildly broad concept, Augusta will be sharing some of the operational tools that she's invested in, um, and these are building blocks to answer a request to integrate healthcare and the arts. Um, when she receives her master's in 2022, Augusta hopes to be working to rewrite a family medicine curriculum that is laced with arts, humanities, and ethical examples to amplify whole personhood. So Augusta, we appreciate you being here today, and we're really looking forward to hearing more about your research. Um, you can go ahead and start your presentation whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am in Maine, far, far away, and I really appreciate you inviting me today. Um, I just wanted to, uh, let's see if we can set a little context. So I am from the uh, Center of Arts and Medicine. I'm studying, I'm in a graduate school program there. Uh, these are some of the things that they have put forward as what's important. Public messaging, art facilitations, healing environments that are made out of art, and social prescription. So we're just gonna set some context. I'm also up in here in Maine working with the Maine Arts and Humanities and Medicine Fellowship. This is a group of artists and doctors coming together to discuss healthcare. Okay, so for this context, in about 2010, I was in Ireland with my husband who makes art for artists. He was overseeing an installation of art for Linda Banglis, who is an artist. And you can see her uh, on the left, there is a water fountain. And then on the right, those are the three graces work that she had made over the series of time at the Walla Walla Foundry. We were at the Iris Museum of Modern Art and I, uh, I was taking a walk. I was looking for some reprieve and I found somebody named David Shrigley in none other than the uh, bookstore. These little drawings, they spoke to me. They were hilarious and they were dark. You see, I had just learned, started to go back to drawing myself. I was making very small and funny little drawings about life and I was utilizing birds. So as you can imagine, this illustration spoke to my language. The mother of my eldest child, my stepdaughter was dying of ALS and not much was in my control. So I could draw. So I'm going to introduce you today to the bird who is our host because I can't be there with you and I'm all the way up here in Maine. Okay, now we're gonna just take a moment. This is in healthcare called thresholding. Um, so I can't necessarily see you, you guys can see me, but you can take a moment and even close your eyes. Just take a moment for yourself, no one has to know. And this is something you can do wherever you are. If you're feeling anxious, Try turning your wings or hands down to your legs. If you're feeling open and receptive, try turning your hands or, or feathers up. Now, consider the difference between sucking air and breathing. You have to remember these as a bird talking. Try breathing. Sucking air makes humans look like a duck. Either way, breath is so precious. And if you want to get maybe a little wild, you could try closing your eyes. Let yourself register where you're sitting, where your feet are touching the ground, if they touch the ground, 
and stay with yourself, not your to-do list, not your pending diagnosis or condition. This is about you. This is just yours this moment. Okay, ready? Here we go. So this talk is about art and medicine. Art in medicine, art and medicine, art around medicine, the intersection of art and medicine. The gap as the bird sees it. Artists need a seat at this table. You can't teach this without the artists. So this talk today is about three things. First, my understanding is we have a lot of doctors and research in the, researchers in the room. So you probably know what continuing medica medical education is. Second, artists has collaborators. We are wild things and something to contend. And lastly, art kits. So I wanna thank Adriana for finding me in the middle of nowhere out in the world and for, for bringing me here today to the Institute of Learning in Retirement. Now, I found it quite interesting, this idea of learning in retirement. It seems to be a step before CME or continuing medical education. Now, I will forewarn you, I am an artist and the observations I'm going to give you are from my artist brain. So here we go. Now, <clears throat> artists and doctors, right? How does a doctor, how does an artist speak doctor? Is that a riddle? Maybe. Um, but as an artist coming into a clinic, remember that earlier sign I was at the main uh, arts and humanities in medicine program up here, I came into a clinic and I started to look around to decide how is it possible that an artist could speak doctor. Doctors have been working since their youth to be a part of a system and an artist is being asked to bring their selves into this. How does that work? Well, it's not going to work if an artist doesn't understand the structure. If learning in the medical system is sequential, like these constant levels of funnels, which many of you probably already know, how do you introduce change? How do you come into all of this where everything is being reduced to very specific understanding? Specifically, if you think about something like, or specifically, if you think about something like family medicine, where you have to know everything from life to death, how do I come in with a new idea? Learning to choose, learning, so, learning something that you choose is quite different than being forced to learn something when you just don't have time. Watching the residents that I was, uh, I was doing work at this spring in a clinic in Maine, uh, there wasn't much time. Anybody who's been through residency knows this. It doesn't have to be explained. So what is it that needs to happen? The residency could have art in the future, but everything has to come from the faculty. The faculty creates the culture. So how do you get buy-in from faculty? CME. This is something that is worth taking a pause with. Okay, let's go to this definition. And most of you probably already know what it is. So continuing medical education. This is something that happens once you're already in practice for those of you who don't know already. And this is not something I knew about until the spring. Continuing medical education consists of educational activities which serve to maintain, develop, or increase the knowledge, skills, and professional performance and relationships that a physician uses to provide services for patients, the public, the public, or the profession. The content of CME is that body of knowledge and skills generally recognized and accepted by the profession as within the, the basic medical sciences, the discipline of clinical medicine and the provision of healthcare to the public. So what if the arts and health are being recognized? They have to be represented. So 
I have been working on teaching artists how to teach CME. That might make a few of you shift in your seat. Artists can be a bit like herding cats and many people do not want an artist to be constricted by lists, but that doesn't mean that artists are not of use. Artists are using creative practice to heal and not cure, just to be clear. There is mixed method research that's being done and it's being piled up in all kinds of virtual libraries. Many of these mixed method researches are in fact based on old ideas. And yet, for those of you who know, things have to be proven to be accepted. So what does it mean to collaborate with an artist? I'm here today to tell you about the story that I went through and what kind of difference was made. Now, coming into the healthcare as an artist, the last thing that anybody wants you to do is to tell them an answer. Really, the best thing to do is to ask a question, what is needed? And as an artist, you can think about those needs and look at the systems that exist and see how to help. But what happens if the questions haven't been thought of yet? Do I have to remind you of this? Do you remember what it felt like to be surrounded by quiet? Do you remember the quiet rumblings of what was happening elsewhere? the tidal wave coming. This is the story of my response. Some say it was a love letter. To me, it was some good old empirical knowledge, according to artists, meaning free association, pulling from things I knew to respond to what was coming to my community, the coronavirus, as it was called at the time. So, do you remember what the big news was in 2020? In our community, we had had a hundred year flood. That's not a small thing. In other places, there was a fire. If you were to go back to that time, what would you say to yourself? Now, this is where I was living at the time. That pink represents the fact that it is wine country. It is a small community on Eastern Washington. It's very far away from Seattle. It is surrounded by hundreds and thousands of acres of wheat fields. It is actually quite like an island. Now, this is a very powerful creature. Her name is Becky Betts. And as you can see, as all the piles of initials that are after her name, she is and has been a part of the healthcare system for a long time. Presently, she is working on her dissertation for a PhD in population health. Now, I had had a conversation with the chief medical officer of the local hospital last spring as COVID was coming. He suggested I reach out to this human. I was pretty lucky. She had started in 2019 a population program, a population health program to meet the community where they existed in the world because they were filling up the emergency department. People were coming in with what she had found was an epidemic, an epidemic of loneliness. When COVID came, this is what she said. During our phone outreach, we'd hear the anxiety and the desperation, explained Becky Betts, manager of Providence Population Health, the team responsible keeping a registry of cases of COVID-19 in Southwestern Washington, from the single mom trying to homeschool her children, uncertain about her employment and terrified of looming test results, to people that can't be with their sick loved ones. Do you remember how this line was so common? These are unprecedented times. Now, this is what we did. We created a program called Arts and Health First Aid Art Kits. It was uh, part of the mission for whole person health in Walla Walla Valley. Now, for those of you from the medical world, maybe you recognize what's on the right. That's my arm. 
That is a surgery bag from the hospital donated. That is a, a brown bag that held surgery bags that were made on the fly at a local art nonprofit. And uh, there's a lot of things in this kit that were thrown together. And let's, I'll show you how this worked out. So here we go. Hi, how are you? Good morning. It is a few days into the pandemic, and I thought I'd just check in with you about what this arts in health is. Well, it might be more than a few days, but here we are. And so what is arts in health? It has a couple different things that it does. It creates art for institutions, for um, healing environments. It utilizes artist mastery for public messaging. And it also does uh, facilitation with artists or artists created facilitations for all kinds of humans, creatives and non-creatives alike. That's kind of what we're doing with these first aid art kits. So what is the whole idea here? Why would you do that? Well, um, you know, Doing sit-ups doesn't make you an athlete, but it makes you a stronger person. And I think most of you know that feeling of listening to music and having it completely take you somewhere else. Well, using art exercises can do a combination of those two things. It can give you a um, distraction and take you on a magic carpet ride, um, but it can also create a path to your own well-being. So thanks for listening. So I mentioned some things in there. I really made them quite simple. And I referenced things that maybe some of you know about. Viktor Frankl has taught us finding a will to live comes from finding a reason to live. Much of what we were doing was creating kits to keep people in place and to also get up in the morning. When completely engaged, truly immersed, so that's just, we're talking about flow theory here. This suggests time, self and time are suspended. Research has shown that this engagement, which can be achieved through a myriad of ways, is a positive distractor. Sometimes you're in your bed or in your room or in your house or in quarantine. In the time of COVID, these are highly possible. Your options are few. So, remember these guys? Did you see them earlier? Here they are. These birds are hosts and they are talking about something. They're talking about the kits. These birds were from the kits. So what is the deal with this thing anyway? Why is the hospital giving me art materials? I mean, well, it is an arts and health first aid art kit. A first aid art kit. First aid is what is given in an emergency. And in our kit, this is just for kids. Well, no, this is for everyone. Did you know that creativity doesn't just pertain to creative types? Did you know that this creative stuff is not just about creating art? You see, self-transcendence does not come easily. It requires a mindfulness and intentionality to activate that potential. Healing as an integration of the various dimensions of self and an awareness or a deeper knowing of self that includes a sense of wholeness. This experience of self-transcendence may promote healing through leading a personal integration of aspects of the adverse situation and then to restore self-esteem and renewed life purpose and meaning of life. Coward and Reed is where this quote came from, but it was really Reed's work. She is a nurse practitioner in Arizona. Self-transcendence is what often allows people to get through an experience. So let's go back to the fact that we're talking about these art kits, right? So we have artist mastery. These kits are made with artist mastery. They're not made by doctors. And they are full of all kinds of art prompts made by artists. These kits are made and they're given to the nurses 
This is what makes a difference. This middle section, this is where it changes. The nurses, not some art center, not some art teacher, but a nurse is handing the kit with a thermometer and an oximeter to a patient in quarantine in their home or wherever it is that they exist. So here's what we were doing, just to give you a quick round of things. The artists were coming together and making the first aid art kits. We received community funding. The kits were given to Population Health, which is a part of Providence St. Mary Medical Center in Walla Walla. And those, they were the vehicle that got to the patients. And all of this went through our local umbrella of Art Walla Walla, which held videos that patients could then see to help them with the prompts that were in the art kits. It's kind of a nice circle, isn't it? Okay, so those prompts I kept talking about, they were in these. Now I want you to take a look a minute. Yes, the name First Aid Art Kits is in English on both of them, but I think you'll see that the one on the left is actually in Spanish. Much of our population spoke Spanish first. And there's nothing quite like being sick and not being able to be seen as a human. There were translators that came in from all over the world and pitched in over a weekend to have this translated so that the people that were receiving the kits on Monday could read them themselves. Okay. Now, again, go back to that thought process. What did it feel like to be in the state of early COVID? What would you have said? What would you have shared? So we were teaching the idea of well-being. What a funny thing, right? How about these words? Do you remember learning about social distancing or quarantine or isolation? As if you have to have these things explained to you now. They're all a part of that newsletter. Because the newsletter is a great place to do both public messaging and art prompts. It's the why, the how, the where, the who. These art kits are a way of communicating. Phone numbers, email, websites, who to turn to, and art materials. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these art kits. In this particular situation, since I was working with the artists in the community, I was able to have the artists reach into their own self-knowledge and talk about the topography. They were able to use their own senses and knowledge of the geography that they were in, that the patients were in, relating to that patient's experience. This becomes a part of the delivery of healthcare. Think about that for a minute. Whole person care is very popular right now, right? but actually seeing the person receiving the care in a situation where they are in isolation, quarantine. What do you have as tools to recognize them? So we used a lot of the usual art supplies, nothing unusual. And we worked with things that were really unprecious. People donated work, uh, donated paper, a lot of, most all of everything was brand new. Um, but it was really just about making something accessible. The kits were thematic. They weren't, they didn't include everything. A nurse would know if she was speaking, most of them were women, I have to admit, to a patient that was homeless or had a pair of scissors in their mansion. This is important. The demographics the social determinants, these things play a role. So when a nurse is seeing a patient for where they exist in the world, they were choosing art kits that did not, that, that worked with their life. Okay, these were some of the ideas and presentations that were both in the art kit and on the website. The yoga breathing, for instance, was only on the website so you could work with the person as they helped you breathe, which was helpful, both anxiety and having a hard time to breathe. The other ones were done by local sort of famous artists. And those kits had all kinds of different ways of exploring them. There were things that were connected across the uh, nation, like the animal mask 
making zoo, they, uh, there was a website where you could enter your mask and be a part of a community and you could do things that really had nothing to do with anybody else and just your own quiet self. You did not have to have to have mastery. You could just follow the directions. There was also coloring pages that were made that were about the area, about the things that they knew. Okay. These ideas are brought to you from artists that were asked to share their mastery using these super simple material list. No, you don't have to follow the lessons. And yes, they all are, are about doing, not the finished product. This is not about making something to be framed. In fact, the whole idea for it to not be precious. So this is where I come in with my public service announcement. We are dealing with humans and caretaking of them. But that doesn't mean that it's not a service. These artists were paid for their work. It's important to remember that artists have things to offer and they should not be asked to volunteer. Do you ask the doctor to volunteer? No, you pay the doctor. I understand in this situation, there was many things that were brought forward that were volunteered, but it is important in healthcare to always pay the artists. Okay, so speaking of payment, here are some of the artists and their names and the things that they did. I have since left Walla Walla. The program is now being run by Sarah Lighty. She's a painter and she is one of the prompts, but I did use the platform to talk about each of these artists, to share their video, to have links to their website. I offered them payment. And this is who we have, Catherine Bell, Squire Broll, Jared Nettles, Maggie Kennedy. You can see the list, they're wonderful. Okay, now come summertime, things settled out. And I think we all thought that maybe we were all going to get through this a little bit faster. It became important to realize that the kits which we had originally invented in those surgery bags were not quite working very well. Two artists that I knew had come home from college and I worked with them to create a box for the kits. The box had plant material that was native to the area. This is Sage Nelson as she was designing the kits. And this is Rachel. She has, they have printed over 800 boxes at this point. Actually, last I checked, she did another 500. So you do the math. Unfortunately, the kits are still needed. So here is what the kit became from the surgery bag. Labeled so the nurse knew what was inside, stackable, and each of them were hand painted or printed rather. Okay, so here's a kit on precious and accessible. Let's just make them real. These are, they have the artist made prompts and it's just not complicated. Now, these two lovely creatures, Anna and Cormac, they came from Whitman College. They were my interns and thanks, thanks to them, they applied and secured a Mellon grant for us to study well being without masks. This is before the vaccine and it was quite precious. I had double mask on so I could at least photograph them for this moment. We worked with that woman, Becky Betts, if you remember her, and a man named Matt Kroll. We used the Warwick Edinburgh mental well being test. Amazingly enough, the COVID, the COVID tests had slowed down enough that the nurses were able to have a script. And that script used this well-being scale to see how a patient was when they first found out they, were, they had a positive test to after they had been using the kit for 14 days. For this data right here is what I was given from Becky as she collected the tests. She had an increase immediately that was apparent but 
Well, and before I tell you the but, let me just share with you some of the quotes, because I have to tell you the reason why we did this research is the nurses kept coming to me when I would deliver the kits and they would say, you don't understand. We call these patients every day in their home and they can't stop telling us how much the kits have changed their experience. We need to record this. So that is why we did the research. But as these quotes were coming in, so were the cases. We were hitting our next peak. No longer could the scripts be given and the research had to stop. Honestly, I loved the kit. It was very helpful for me during my time of having COVID. It took my mind off of it. I mean, what more do you need than that? The coloring pages were awesome. I love that they were created by local artists. Wow, talk about whole person care. You guys thought of everything. So our kids, they are a tool for the whole you. Providing our kids is for the moment right now. And after leaving Walla Walla, I went to that place at the beginning, remember that square where I was working with Northern Lights Health. And I started making art kits for residents. And I would move around a residency clinic offering these for their block conference and their curriculum, trying to educate the use of the kit. Now, I would say that using art kits is not a perfectly figured out thing, but when it is handed from a person like a doctor or a nurse or someone in healthcare, and they hand it to someone who is in need of a new answer, an answer that is so old, it can provide space and time in a way that is really about what's inside of them. So if you were to make a kit, or if you were to receive a kit, or if you were to talk to another doctor about a kit, or if you were to be still involved in the medical system, you can imagine how these kits could become a vehicle for a public health message. It's a way of connecting patients and healthcare with artists in the area the artist's economy. But it's a way of communicating something that a patient needs to know. Maybe it's a way of communicating a better way of dealing with a diabetic foot. And or maybe it's a way of communicating about how to deal with the food that comes through WIC. Or maybe it's a way of communicating and reminding a human that they exist and that you see them. It's an old tool. And I believe to go back to the beginning that artists are here to collaborate. Now, Today, I went through three objectives. CMA as a place to teach art ideas. And I just spoke specifically about the one that I have done the most work in. Collaboration with an artist can shift the human experience beyond diagnosis. The patients in Walla Walla are still receiving those kits and it's changed their ability to deal with the anxiety around COVID. There are uh, art facilitations that are using art kits around the world. Uh, the veterans, uh, the VA is using them. There is programming all over in the UK. It's part of social prescription. If you remember that red social prescription in the beginning, they have a pilot in Massachusetts where they're connecting with artists to be able to start creating social prescription programming. This is part of the change and future of medicine. And art kits are a really tangible way of looking at that. It doesn't have to be 
one off. These art kits can be something that's put into somebody's hand and they can experience that moment beyond the one interaction of healthcare. Because isn't that the question? How do you make it sustainable? Learning the habits, learning the muscles about looking at the internal universe inside of you with the tools that we've had for a long time. This is Becky and I in the very beginning. We're not even wearing masks. We had no idea what we were getting into. Thank you. I was wondering if anybody is still out there and if you would like to ask questions, I can turn off my screen share and we can talk about the things that I have shared today. Yes, we're here. <laughs> Okay, I would love to answer questions. I feel like I spent a lot of time talking. I don't see any in chat. Walter, do you have any comments or? Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, I'm an engineer, not a medical doctor. So it's an all new experience for me. Thank you very much for being with today and I hope you enjoy me. <laughs> Well, this is uh, Pam Burns. Uh, I am was a physician um, and a researcher. So the question I have that you didn't talk about too much uh, were your sort of medical or clinical intermediaries in terms of uh, passing the kits that were created through caregivers uh, to the patients, and it'd be interesting, I think, to have you just sort of stand a little bit uh, on that part of the interface. So if I heard the question correctly, you were asking about the experience of the people that were handing out the, um, kit, the, the art kits, is that correct? Because it... Yes. Okay, so the hospital was willing to find answers anywhere. And this was a moment that was not normal. And uh, they admitted that and repeated it, that that was not how it was normally going to happen and probably wouldn't happen again. So they were open to new solutions. The hospital itself did not know what to do with the art kits. They are used in many hospitals around the country all the time, but this hospital hadn't yet learned that tool. So what happened was population health was able to take the tool and use it in a very specific way. In the very beginning, they handed them out to all kinds of people that they just wanted to make them stay home. So every single shelter in our community, which we had several, received kits. There were kits made uh, for people that were in long-term care and all kinds of different ways. But that was before we knew that we would have, you know, 50 to 100 cases a day. These kits became apparent to be an amazing tool to have something to talk about besides just how is your breathing. The nurses would call once a day for 10 to 14 days. These kits gave them a way of seeing their patient that was beyond that real simple checklist, right? And the, the, the nurses didn't have to do any work except for ask questions. They didn't have to prepare the kits. And they found it to be a breath of fresh air. They would turn to me and just, I mean, no one touched anyone, if you remember correctly, but they would just smile at me and say, thank you. I, this is changing everything. Um, they had to talk to them every day. They were sick or they were, had no, or they had no symptoms, but they had a positive test. So 
it just gave them a vehicle for larger understanding of humanity. Is that, does that help? Is that kind of approach the conversation there? I, I will reiterate that the hospital, I mean, once a person had COVID and they were in the hospital, obviously they weren't using the kits, right? I mean, I, I'm not ignorant about the fact that, that that's not part of what was happening. Potentially, kits were being hand, did get handed out in the hospital to families so that they had something to cope with while they were in the waiting room or if they were being turned away because they couldn't see their loved ones. All of these things happened and are still happening. So the kits were used in other ways. Um, since then, I have had doctors use the kits for, for instance, a mother who had four children and was working three jobs she needed something to find space. She could not afford to buy art supplies. It was, it blew her mind to have this resident doctor hand her an art kit instead of handing her a prescription of some drug to find space. Can you imagine what that felt like? It was kind of mind blowing. Mm -hmm. This is the engineer again. Uh, do you? Take where the heart gets for the disease, like a broken leg or arm or COVID or a terminal situation. Can, can you repeat that? I'm, I missed the very part of it before the broken leg. Oh, do you tailor the kits individually so that it is different for a broken leg or COVID oh. or terminal cancer or such other differences? in the situation for the person receiving the kids. Absolutely. You know, you have to think about accessibility. My father doesn't have hands. So if I were to give him oil pastels, he would roll his eyeballs, right? So you have to find the right art materials for the right people. And also some art materials can be very stressful. And so there is a huge world of just considering what is appropriate, what makes sense, where do you exist in the world? Uh, you know, there are patients that are waiting for heart transplants in hospitals and artists come in with, you know, whole palettes of acrylic paint and canvases and they have time to make a whole painting, right? Or you have artists that come in and um, write whole songs. It doesn't, it's not just art materials. I mean, a, an art kit can mean a lot of things, right? It can be writing poetry. It can write, writing your life story. It can be, um, it can be in relationship to movement. It's really, of course, these things are using the mastery of the artist to fit the need. Uh, it's really important to understand who your population is. So if your population is transgender youth, or if your population is, you know, veterans for uh, male veterans, um, of the Vietnam War, I mean, you're going to have different things to talk about, right? But that's not, so you, you have the mastery of the doctor collaborating with the mastery of the artist. You consider their ages, what they're capable of doing, what made them comfortable, what they need, what their needs are. I mean, this, of course, these things are absolutely important. What their sickness is, do they have language? Do they have memory? I'm seeing nods, but I, and I appreciate those nods. Thank you. So, uh, you know, the art kits, it's not a new idea. It's just about handing it through the healthcare system. We have another question here. Great. Hi, uh, I'm Don McLaughlin. I arrived a little bit late. Uh, I'm Dean Emeritus of the College of the Arts. I was involved in starting the Philip the Arts in Medicine. I want to thank you for your excellent presentation. And I have a question, which perhaps you've already answered this, so I apologize. Are you currently a student in the MA in Arts and Medicine program at UF? I am. Could you, I please, am. Could you please tell us a little bit about what that experience was like and the, you know, the, the experiences you're having as a student in that program? Well, I'd love to talk about that. It's, you know, an interesting, um, so I'm an artist. You probably figured that out. 
And I was looking at going back to grad school. As an artist, the assumed route is to get an MFA. I was sitting in my house and I Googled art and medicine as if I thought I could make that up. And I think that a lot of people think that they're making that up when they put those words together. But in fact, there was a graduate program, as you know, at the University of Florida. And they brought, uh, in my conversations with them as I was exploring the program, they said that their priorities were public health. So that's communication and how to listen and listen again before you do the work. It is about using your visual mastery to communicate in that public health. It is about being an art facilitator, which is not about your own work. It's literally about being someone who can listen and to hold space for someone to do art and to facilitate them in that process. And that process is not about making something that's gonna hang up the wall necessarily. It may very well be something that it's just, we're just doing art to make art, to see that feeling. And then lastly, and the reason why I had come to the program was to create healing spaces. So that means making art in, uh, understanding art's role in a waiting room or an exam room, or you know, in all over a hospital, in, in hospitals and healthcare. It is something that I still hope to do because I'm an installation artist and a photographer, but as an artist, I responded to the need. And at the same time, as I was responding to the need, the lead, the head, the Dean of the school was a woman named Jill Sankey who started the program a long time ago. And her efforts really have been to join up with a Dr. Daisy Fancourt in the UK. And the two of them, have been working on social prescription. Now, Daisy has made a lot of headway in the UK. And unfortunately, I think things had slowed down a little bit as far as policy making goes for Jill um, because COVID hit as everything has slowed down since COVID hit, but actually social prescription was able to really blossom during COVID. And there is a huge movement that's coming out of the University of Florida that is utilizing artist practitioners as social prescription. So a doctor can prescribe dance classes. A doctor can prescribe going to a museum. Uh, a doctor can prescribe art kits. Um, you can also prescribe going to see, you know, uh, th there's things that are social engagement and then there are things that are walking in nature. You have all these different things that are alternative social prescriptions that are not what you classically think of as a prescription. And the work that they're doing is literally going through the things that need to happen. So working with insurance, working with programs across the country, making sure there's a delivery system and making sure that there's buy-in from the stakeholders. So that program has been about learning theory and research and mixed method methods and really how to, in their view, how to enter the healthcare system as an artist. and. The fun part about that, of course, is that all artists feel that they need to re reinvent the wheel. And uh, so as an artist that works with systems, I'm always looking for, if any of you were gardeners, let me use this as, a, as, as what I, as I, the way I think about it. When I design a garden, I often use lines of boxwood. Now the line of the boxwood is a geometrical line it holds its shape and color consistently, kind of like a rule, but it allows the other plants that I plant around it to blossom and unfurl and then be very wild. So you have this balance, right? It's about creating a structure for the artist to work in and for the structures to allow the artist to do their work. And all of this is about learning how to respect the two. That is why the CMEs were and are a continued goal of mine because it is not something that's being talked about at the school. Learning how to get respect from healthcare and not to be considered othered is still an issue. So I'm working to change that. Uh, uh, I think what you just said has been true of arts therapy over the decades, actually. 
that is dedicated the well-deserved respect. But you mentioned Zell Zell Zombie, who is the director of the Center for the Arts of Medicine. What indicator of the respect the discipline is receiving is that she, if I understand correctly, has recently been appointed to the board of the CDC. Yeah. I them through this pandemic. Is that right? Yes, she did amazing work with the Ebola and she's done amazing work leading with the coronavirus. And um, she's a great voice out there. And it's wonderful that she's being listened to, isn't it? Another question here? Um, a comment. Um, this is Jan Wollenthal and my son is a 1990 something. You have read. He cre had to create his own um, degree in biological illustration, but he went ahead and became a medical illustrator. Did you ever consider that field? Well, that's a great. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. It's something that I um, I am not. If you've ever been to the museum of um, various artists. Sometimes you can see that they're wonderful illustrators before they start to learn their way. I, I did do illustrating, but I've always been a little bit wild and raw. What was more interesting to me was something called graphic medicine, which you might ask your son about. Graphic medicine is literally using graphic novel concepts to amplify experience. It's not so far away from what I was doing with that bird, right? I was kind of taking you along and giving you something that's not a human and it can be anything and any gender and any anything, right? To talk about something that is that otherness. You know, there's stuff that exists here that is not here, if you can see my hands. And that it, it I, I'm not an illustrator in the sense of, uh, I wanna say like, Leonardo da Vinci or, you know, um, I'm going to blank on all the names, you know, people who look at birds or looked at human bodies or and pulled them apart. But I use illustration to amplify emotion, compassion, empathy, understanding. And I am, um, there's, there's a whole department out of the University of Pennsylvania and it's called graphic medicine. I, hold on a second. I have this book. If you tell your son about it, you might, maybe it'd be a good gift, but Graphic Medicine Manifesto. And it really talks about this. Um, you know, again, it's just using old ideas, literally drawings. Now, one of the things I would say about drawing, which is a great line that I learned from uh, a, an illustrator named uh, Linda Berry, don't use stick figures. There's just not enough room for a ghost to live inside of. And, <laughs> but to really use these drawings to, to hold space for the things that need to be talked about. You know, there's some amazing work that's been done around, for instance, trying to portray what it feels like to have Parkinson's or um, things that are not physically seen like um, depression. You know, there's, there's lots of different ways of communicating these things besides words. How are we doing? Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions in chat. Great. Andriana, do you have any comments, final comments? Um, yeah, I mean, well, thank you so much, Augusta. This was fascinating. Um, I guess the, the only question that's kind of been on my mind, I guess, since the the art kit initiative that you described, like since it is so tied to COVID, do you think it can translate to post-pandemic context, like thinking forward to like encourage that continuing well-being for patients? That's a really great question. A really great question. So I've actually been thinking a lot about this, and and there's no reason why it can't, can't transfer. I mean, if I had thought about this, um, I would have sent each of you art kits, and you could have had an art kit to do during this conference. There are conferences happening all over the country right now uh, with medical education. So what if those conferences, the CMEs were being taught and everybody in their own home, office, kitchen, 
wherever they are, had an art kit to use that went along with the lecture. Um, I have been working with clinics to be able to order whole piles of them to just hand them out to, you know, how people hand things out. There's just making the barrier not be to, to take away those barriers to make them accessible. They don't they don't cost a great deal of money to make and they make a huge difference. So then you also have therapy. So uh, lots of people do therapy now online. I mean, think about the virtual world and our kids, right? You have all of these different areas. There's also just the basic simplicity of where I'm coming from, art facilitating and art, art practitioners literally will work with people all over the world, wherever they exist in the world. And so that person receives the art kit and then they're facilitated by the artist. It's made a huge difference. You know, people who don't have a car, don't have transportation, don't want to come to town, don't have time to come to town, don't have childcare, can sit on the Zoom and participate. And if they had an art kit, and they can actually do something. They can feel what it feels like to push that oil pastel across the paper, or they can see what happens when they add water to just a watercolor pen, like these very simple things that we all know and have played with. And it really speaks to that inner five-year-old, right? Like where you, when you were allowed to play with art materials, bringing that into real life, everyday life, there's no reason why it can't be accessible. So, do I think that there's a future for it? Yes, I think there's a future for it. And I'm hoping, um, I'm actually, I'm working on that right now. And, and I hope that more, um, I'm hoping to work with clinics, doctors, uh, healers of all different kinds, artists, facilitators, and conferences to start getting these out into people's hands. Amazing. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with this. It's great. <laughs> Well, maybe you'll come do some anthropological virtual testing on it. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Um, Adriana, do you want to give us a sneak peek at what next week's session will be? Sure. Um, so in the next in our next talk, we, we're going to have Edward Quinn coming to speak with us, and he's um, part of um, Dr. Connie Mulligan's genetics lab. And so he's going to talk about a study. We lost him. Oh, she froze. Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> that he's been working if I cut out for a moment. Um, yeah, so he, he's going to talk about his epigenetics work. Well, Augusta, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who's joined us on Zoom and here at Okamak in our Oak Room. Everybody stay well. Thanks again. Awesome. Bye. Thank you so much, Augusta. Thank you. <laughs>